Hello, thank you everybody um, for joining us uh, and for joining this webinar to discuss the current state of gun violence research and the federal funding landscape. This webinar will be recorded and emailed to registrants in the next few days. This week, Giffords Law Center released a first of its kind survey of the research landscape that seeks to identify trends in gun violence research publications in 2021 and to identify gaps that warrant for further analysis and additional resources moving forward. Today, you'll be hearing from two Giffords experts, as well as leaders working on this important topic. Our Giffords experts are Kelly Drain, Giffords Research Director and the author of this report, and Adzi Vokiwa, Giffords Federal Affairs Director, who will provide an overview of the federal landscape. They will be joined by our special guest, Senator Markey, who is the junior senator for Massachusetts and has served in Congress for more than 40 years. Senator Markey has been a longtime champion for gun safety, sponsoring bills to better regulate gun dealers and ban 3D printing guns. He also led the charge among his Senate colleagues to provide federal funding for gun violence research through the CDC and NIH for many years, ultimately resulting in the appropriation of $25 million for those agencies in fiscal year 2020 after more than 20 years without funding. We will also be joined by Dr. Chathan Sathia, who is a pediatric surgeon of, uh, at Cohen's Children's Medical Center in Queens and the director of Northwell's Center for Gun Violence Prevention. So without further ado, Senator Markey, as we said, you've been a longtime champion for federal funding of gun violence research, even before it was a popular topic among your congressional colleagues. Would you like to just say a quick hello and share with us a little bit about the current federal efforts to fund research? No, absolutely. And uh, thank you all so much for all of the work which you do on an ongoing basis, thanks to the Giffords uh, Law Center, to Nico, Kelly, Adzi, uh, for hosting this uh, webinar on federal gun violence research and for Gifford's uh, tireless activism and leadership on gun violence uh, uh, prevention. Even as I'm speaking uh, to you, I'm thinking of my uh, my, uh, my great friend, Gabby Giffords, and uh, just love serving with her in Congress and just, in, just always so amazed at her incredible leadership and courage and uh and we just have to keep fighting you know the issues that uh, she has always led on so let's just be loud let's just be clear the the gun violence that is plaguing our nation and taking upwards of forty thousand lives annually is a public health crisis uh, in july 2021 the government accountability office released a report on the public health impact of the gun violence epidemic in the united states today Gun violence costs our healthcare system more than $1 billion every single year. More than half of gun violence victims live in zip codes with a median household income below $44,000. And patients identified as Black account um, uh, for more than half of inpatient hospital stays and costs incurred due to gun violence. So gun violence is disproportionately impacting Black and Brown communities across the United States. What we know about the victims of gun violence makes clear that the gun violence epidemic is both a health justice issue and a racial justice issue. In order to solve this crisis, we first need to understand it. We need to know exactly what is happening and why. And, and to do that, we need data. We cannot manage gun violence without measuring it first. But before 2020, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention received zero dollars in funding from Congress to study the root causes of this epidemic zero dollars. And that's because for nearly 20 years, from 1996 until 2018, there was a statutory ban on federal research into gun violence. But in December of 2019, for the first time since 1996, uh, Representative Carolyn Maloney of New York and I were finally able to remove the NRA stranglehold over science and secure $25 million in funding for the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institutes of Health for Gun Violence Research. And in December of 2020, we did it again. This funding is critical uh, to ensuring what is going on, uh, like the GAO report that I mentioned, but we cannot stop there. We need more funding to truly study and understand the root causes of our gun violence epidemic and finally put an end to this scourge. We have reintroduced our bill to authorize and fund this research with a price tag of $250 million over five years. And we're hopeful that at the end of the fiscal year, 
2022 appropriations process draws near, we will double our 25 million in funding for gun violence prevention research to $50 million in the coming year. This is the kind of gun violence prevention that everyone, regardless of political party or affiliation, should support. No one should be afraid of nonpartisan scientific research, not Democrats, not Republicans, and not even the NRA. Data is key, science is key, and understanding where the problem lies is key. If we wanna stop this wave of gun violence, we need better information about what is causing it and what can be done to prevent it. So let's give the medical, scientific, and public health community the resources they need. The question becomes, are we ready to answer uh, the data with action? Are we ready to bring our willpower to bear on this life and death issue? Are we ready to finally save lives at the federal level? I know this group is because you've been fighting these fights for years and we're all ready to continue this work. Let's study the scourge, let's understand what's causing it, and then let us put an end to it. So thank you so much, everyone, for all of the great work which you are doing and I'd love to have a, a little conversation with you if you'd like. That would be great. Thank you so much, Senator. And as you said, it's so important that we get the research that will help inform policy. Um, but as a policymaker, can you share with us a little bit about what that looks like? Um, how does research help inform your work and how will this be useful to you and your colleagues? Well, um, first it's um, imperative that not only Congress authorizes annual appropriations for gun violence research and then appropriates funds, but that it increases the amounts that we spend. So. The 25 million that Representative Maloney and I helped secure is a good start, but we've got 20 years of lost time to make up. And so there's so many questions that need answers, answers that can help to save lives. And I'm gonna to continue to work to make sure that we get that uh, funding uh, because obviously uh, we, can, we can do this. I've got 36 senators uh, who have signed on to my um, Gun Violence Prevention Research Act already. So uh, we did it a, a, on a bipartisan basis in the past after decades of having it be blocked. So I'm gonna continue to do this. And I'm also gonna work to continue to abolish the filibuster because the filibuster is preventing the Senate from acting on gun safety and long a list of other important issues um, that absolutely have to be dealt with. Uh, voting rights, climate change. Uh, so this Jim Crow era relic stands in the way of progressive legislation. That includes uh, ensuring that we have strong gun safety laws on the books. So thank you so much, all of you, for everything uh, that you're doing on this issue. And I'm really looking forward to partnering with you uh, in, um, in the future. And hopefully we will have another big success this year. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Senator. We so appreciate your time. We know it's a busy time for you always. Um, and we really appreciate your time and your partnership and your hard work on this issue. So thank you so much for coming and speaking with us here today. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. Thanks. And thanks thank for all you. your great work. Great leaders. Thank all you. of you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And I'm very excited to share that we also have um, our other special guest here, Dr. Chathan Sathia. Um, so I would love for you to also thank you for joining us. It looks like you are also in the middle of a busy day. Um, would you like to give a quick hello and introduce yourself a little bit to the group? Um, we, we were able to give a, them a little bit of information, but um, anything you'd like to share with us? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and, and I, I appreciate the flexibility here. Um, we were just urgent, a lot of urgent surgeries. Um, so my name is Chetan Satya. I'm a pediatric surgeon. I'm also the trauma director at Cohen Children's Medical Center, which is the largest level one trauma center here in New York. And um, this is an issue that is very, very dear to my heart. I did spend a lot of time in Chicago uh, during my training and my initial job. And then I came here to New York. And you know, it became obvious right away that we were just treating so many children with bullet wounds. It was um, really, really eye-opening. So um, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that when I got to Northwell Health here two years ago, our CEO, Michael Dowling, took a big stance on gun violence prevention, which has really helped to empower us on the front lines to be able to prioritize this public health crisis, 
Uh, we have a Center for Gun Violence Prevention, which is focused on charting a public health approach to this crisis. And again, I, I, re I really do want to thank all of you um, and the Senator for your hard work in obtaining this critical funding. You know, we are one of the first centers to obtain NIH funding for firearm injury prevention research, and that's all thanks to you. Well, thank you so much. Um, and again, for taking time out of your very busy and important day um, and for all that you are doing and for your work on this issue. Um, you know, I know Northwell Health has been awarded 1.4 million from the NIH to evaluate a universal screening tool that will help prevent gun injuries. Um, can you talk a little bit about this project and why the federal funding is so crucial to the project's success? Absolutely. Um, I would say the fund, you know, the federal funding is not only crucial, um, it is what make, made this type of research possible, right? You know, I, and I think, um, again, thank you to all of you because it has been totally absent, right? When you talk about prioritizing this as a research issue, even in the academic medicine world, a lot of researchers don't consider this similar to cancer or heart disease or other leading causes of death. So, that funding that we were able to obtain really made this a legitimate disease that we could study and kind of you know, raises awareness across the country um, about how we're considering this as a healthcare issue. Uh, our project is focused on universal screening. So we intend, and we already are, asking every patient who comes into our emergency departments questions around firearm injury risk. So we're screening them. We're asking questions related to firearm access inside or outside of the household and questions related to gun violence risk, two different things, and then intervening, whether that be gun locks, firearm safety counseling from physicians, which we know is very effective in promoting safe storage, or whether or not we're talking about violence interventions, which we also know is very, very effective in breaking the cycle of violence. We are then evaluating outcomes and seeing how our interventions actually make a difference. So this is a very ambitious project um, to roll out. And again, we couldn't do it without this funding. Great. And thank you so much. And, um, you know, this is a public health issue, gun violence, and we need folks like you at the front line helping to figure out how to treat and handle and prevent gun violence and gun injuries. Um, so we are so appreciative and know your time is short. So uh, if there's anything else you'd like to share with this group, please feel free. Otherwise, we just want to thank you for all your hard work and dedication to the issue. Yeah, no, I, I just want to say, you know, we, we, uh, we need to keep we need more, um, you know, 25 million is really a small, small portion of, uh, you know, funding that other leading causes of death get, as all of you know. So your work is much appreciated and really makes what we're doing possible. So thank you again. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sathia, and uh, we appreciate your time and we'll talk to you hopefully soon again. Thank you. Um, and now we will move to our Giffords experts, Kelly and Udzi. Um, Udzi, let's start with you because we've spent some time now talking a little bit about this federal landscape and the funding that has been um, appropriated in recent years. Um, you work with many federal policymakers, including Senator Markey on this issue. And I'm curious if there are any insights onto the, as to the kind of research that policymakers want to prioritize or areas that have been identified as priorities for future study. Sure, thanks, Nico. Um, that is a great question. So um, as Senator Markey mentioned, um, unfortunately, the public health community had to cope with a more than 20 year absence of, of federal funding when it comes to gun research, gun violence research. Um, and you know, in the interim, we saw some states kind of step up and fund their own violence research centers. We saw schools of public health lead the charge but it really wasn't enough due to the scope of the American gun violence epidemic. So uh, I think one of the biggest things that has happened in that in those 20 years is that we've had a number of new policy um, interventions come to the forefront, policies like extreme risk laws, um, policies that um, Dr. Safia mentioned, like violence intervention. And these are policies that at the federal level, we see a lot of interest in from members of Congress. Um, and in the states and cities where they've been implemented, there's a preliminary data that they can be really effective, but we really need um, comprehensive federal research into some of these new and emerging policy ideas when it comes to gun violence prevention. And that's where we really see um, an interest and desire to direct funding when it comes to federal policymakers. 
Okay, thank you so much, Edzi. Um, you know, and we've sort of set the stage for what has been done in terms of funding thus far and how it's helped thus far. But I think to really share what we know about what research has been occurring um, and what we need to continue learning um, is our report author, Kelly Drain, who is also Gifford's research director. Kelly, can you share with us um, more about the report findings themselves? Yeah, absolutely, Nico. Um, let me share my screen. Um, okay, I'm hoping that shared with everybody, or now it's shared with everybody. Um, so thank you all um, for being here today. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Um, as Nico said, I'm going to talk about some of the work that the research team at Giffords has done to better understand the current state of the gun violence research field. Um, we have been working on this report for over a year um, in which we tracked and analyzed trends in gun violence research publications um, to identify gaps in current scientific attention and also opportunities for future work. Um, so just for some background, this project really came about because one of the things that I do at Giffords is, um, to, is I monitor gun violence research and I help to make sure that those new findings are incorporated into the, all of the policy and advocacy work that we do. And so I have read hundreds of these articles over the years, and I felt like I had a pretty good sense of what the field was prioritizing and covering. But I wanted to look at this really systematically and try and understand what is and isn't getting covered um, and what is and isn't getting researched. Um, so, and we also felt like it was a great time to do this project because of the historic and unprecedented increases in um, gun violence research funding in recent years. You know, all of the other panelists have spoken about the, the federal investments with the CDC and NIH, but I would also say that um, private funders have really stepped up in recent years to make significantly more funding available to study this issue. Um, and as this money has become available, there has been more discussion about how and where it should be spent. So NORC at the University of Chicago and the Joyce Foundation, who um, I should mention um, is a funder of Giffords. Um, both of these organizations have done some really good work and released um, resources about the kind of research and data that we need to prioritize in the coming years with the new funding. And so our hope is that this report will be an additional resource about some of those needs um, and opportunities that we have in terms of research on this issue. Um, so as I mentioned, we endeavored to collect every gun violence research article published in 2021, and we created a coding database to capture information about the characteristics of each article. So for example, um, we looked at things like whether an article focused on homicide or suicide or some other form of gun violence. We also kind of characterized articles by whether they um, were a policy evaluation or whether they were describing patterns of gun violence. Um, so we looked at the focus of the articles. Um, and we also wanted to look at whether the article um, involves study of any particular groups of people like children or gun owners. Um, over the year, we collected and analyzed 493 research articles that were published in 2021. And again, we coded over 60 variables on each of these articles. Um, just to dig into a few of the findings, as I said, one of the things that we were interested in was whether certain types of gun violence were more represented in the research than others. Um, so this chart compares the focus of articles that we collected to some historical data on gun deaths. Um, as you can see, of studies that focused on a particular form of gun violence, 58% focused on interpersonal gun violence, like gun homicides and gun assaults. And about half as many articles, or just 27%, provided specific focus on gun suicide or self-harm. Um, a smaller number of articles focused on unintentional shootings or police shootings. Um, and I also think it's interesting to note that less than 1% of the articles that we reviewed looked at hate crimes or violent extremism involving firearms. Um, just to focus a little bit on the interpersonal gun violence studies, you know, we know that there are a lot of different factors that drive interpersonal gun violence in the U.S. Um, and so we wanted to look more specifically at, at those, that focus as well. Um, we found that a roughly equal number of studies focused on mass shootings and community violence. It was about 29% for each of these. Um, a smaller number of articles focused on domestic violence. Again, I would just note, um, you know, mass shootings account for about one to 2% of all gun deaths, um, depending on how they're counted. So the proportions at which some of these issues were studied in the 2021 articles we looked at um, does differ somewhat um, from the burden of injury and death that these injuries cause in the US. Um, 
we also wanted to look at the publications um, in terms of the outcomes that they studied. So we kind of broadly classified studies as either being problem-focused or solution-focused studies. Problem-focused studies were those that described the problem of gun violence in terms of its trends, patterns, or risk factors. Solution-focused studies were those that looked at policy or programmatic means to prevent gun violence. Most of the studies in our review um, were focused on describing the problem of gun violence, about 70%. Um, and far fewer studies examined specific policies or programs that were intended to prevent gun violence. Um, I did want to note that you know, across the whole sample, we saw only 3% of studies were classified as policy evaluations that measured the impact of gun policy on firearm violence. So even though we had other studies that looked at policy, we only had a small handful of studies that were actually evaluating the effectiveness of those policies. Um, I also think it's interesting to note that of the program-related studies, most of those studies were looking at firearm safety education programs or safe storage counseling programs. Less than one in five of the program-related studies focused on community violence intervention strategies. Um, in terms of groups of people that received specific study, we saw a lot of variation, and I should note that some of these groups were studied sort of related to their risk of victimization. Others were studied related to the role that they may play in gun violence prevention. Um, but we did find that 10 times as many articles were published on children and youth as old, compared to older adults in 2021. Um, I also think it's important to note that 16% of articles provided new data or specific analysis of gun owners. And just 4% of the articles we looked at examined veterans. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk on really quick, or to touch on really quickly, was um, the important role that state funding can play in promulgating this research. So, um, both Uzi and Senator Markey and um, have talked about the importance of federal funding, um, and Uzi also mentioned the role that that states have played in in sort of filling the gaps um, in federal um, in the lack of federal funding over over the last 25 years. Um, but I think what we found in our review was that that there was evidence that these state-funded research centers um, in California, New Jersey, and Washington, uh, which operate with funding appropriated by the state, play a really critical role in um, creating new gun violence research. Um, in fact, 15% of all the studies that we looked at um, were produced by researchers from those centers. So I am going to stop there, um, but I do just want to say that if there's any, um, there's more information in our report. And I'm also happy to answer questions if anyone wants to reach out through email. Great, thank you so much, Kelly. Um, and since you've offered, I do have a question for you. Um, based on your findings, can you share a little bit about what recommendations you have for the field of gun violence research moving forward? Yeah, that's a great question and a really good point, Nico. Um, you know, we did make several recommendations in response to our findings in the report, and we wrote this report specifically with the intention that we would be able to look at ways that the research field could be strengthened. Um, you know, I would say our first recommendation has sort of been alluded to by other panelists, um, but you know, the most important recommendation is that we just need more research on gun violence, and there needs to be more research funding to do it. Um, you know, we have talked about there's been a lot of investment in this field, but gun violence is still not researched at the levels that other leading causes of death are. Um, and we saw in our review that there were so many topics and questions that didn't get enough coverage. And so we need more funding to make sure we can adequately study every aspect of this issue. Um, and sort of related to the funding piece, we also made a recommendation around improving the way that we collect gun violence data. Um, so just as a very, very quick example, in the United States, the collection of data on non-fatal shootings, the injuries that don't result in death, um, is somewhat limited. And when we looked at articles published in 2021, we saw very few studied this kind of injury. Um, and so I think it was a reflection of the fact that there are deficits in the collection of this data that have resulted in inadequate study of what is really a huge part of our nation's gun violence epidemic. And so we made some recommendations around the idea that we need more funding to create and scale data collection efforts and that we would also like to see more efforts being made to facilitate data sharing between government agencies. Um, a few of the other recommendations kind of have to do with the content of research. So we talked about in the report the need to prioritize gun violence prevention policy and program evaluation, and also to create research that is responsive to emerging trends and policy discussions. 
Um, and then I'll just briefly say the last two, we didn't talk as much about this um, in our findings today, but, but we did look at some factors related to the field of gun violence in particular, um, and some things that we think researchers and funders can really um, take action on. And so one of those things is that we saw very few um, partnerships between researchers and community members in the study we reviewed. This is um, you know, a research methodology where um, researchers would engage in equitable partnerships with community members to produce equitable, reflexive research. Um, and yet we didn't really see much of this in 2021. And so we would encourage researchers to think about um, how they can incorporate these partnerships into their work. And also how um, we would encourage funders to think about how they can fund these kinds of projects. And just um, the last recommendation, which is somewhat similar, is that we want um, to encourage the field of research to be made more accessible. So we actually, as we were collecting these articles, we found that only a third of these articles were available on what we call open access. So they were, um, that meant that they were free and we didn't have to pay for those articles. Um, and so that was, you know, really alarming to us that, that so much gun violence research is, is inaccessible to people that don't, um, that can't afford to pay for it or, or just aren't able to, um, to access it. And so, um, you know, we know that we the, re the point of doing research is that it gets disseminated to people that are designing and implementing solutions. So we made some recommendations on how research could be made more accessible to people um, outside of the research field. Great, thank you so much, Kelly. Um, and, you know, we've now talked a little bit about how we have made some important strides in funding gun violence research, but obviously a lot more is needed. Um, and a big part of that is critical voices like those of Senator Markey or Dr. Sathia, because, um, you know, it's important that we hear more medical professionals and lawmakers treat gun violence as a public health issue. And that that is incredibly important. And so I'd like to ask both of you to sort of weigh in as to why being able to view, treat, and understand gun violence is plays such an important role and how important the increase of, of voices and professionals speaking out on this issue um, has impacted and improved the work. Um, Adi, I, I, would you like to, to share? Sure. So I think, um, as Senator Markey mentioned, you know, we had this period of more than 20 years where there was no federal funding for gun violence research. And part of what changed, um, in addition to more lawmakers, frankly, recognizing the fact that we needed this research and, you know, that gun violence was being discussed more and more as a public health crisis and that required public health research funding for us to better understand it, um, is that this became more of a priority, I think, for the voting public, as well as the medical community. One of the things that we saw was, um, you know, during that 20 year absence that gun violence prevention organizations and the medical community and public health community really came together to demand that Congress um, start funding this research again. And I think that that really made the difference hearing from such a diverse group of advocates and experts about how impactful this research could be um, in helping to inform policy and to make sure that you know, we're in, enacting laws and supporting programs that will ultimately help to save lives. Um, so I think that that is an incredibly um, important thing to keep going. Um, that momentum of, um, of advocates and the medical community working together is significant. And, um, you know, one of the most uh, important things about this research and this report that Kelly has um, put together is that it really provides um, guidance for next steps and how we can continue to grow this funding and, and really the justification for growing this funding. So I would say my, my ask and my call to everyone who's watching today is just to continue contacting your members of Congress, urging them to increase funding for this research year over year. And if you're able to um, connect with medical partners in your community, that's something we're happy to help with as well. But um, just to continue to make the call that we need more funding for gun violence research to inform policies and make sure that we're focusing on the types of policies that will really have the greatest impact and save as many lives as possible. Okay, thank you so much. And Kelly, um, do you have anything else you can add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think what Adi said is, is, is right. And, you know, I guess I would just sort of 
also bring us back to the moment that we're, we're in right now. I mean, I think most people um, that are that have joined today probably know that we are facing some of the highest levels of gun violence that we ever have. And, and I think every one of us wants something to be done. And um, no, no American wants to live in a country where we have gun violence that is this prevalent. But I think, you know, in these kinds of moments of crisis, um, there are people who want us to respond based on sort of personal instinct or gut instinct. Like I, and I think the role that research plays and the reason that research is, is essential to the work that we do is that it tells us what is going to work and what isn't going to work. Um, and so, you know, I think we need to be investing in research now more than ever. I mean, we need to know as much as we can so that we can respond as best as we can to this crisis. Um, so I would just, again, as, as Abby said, just, I think thinking about how this can be, this is a foundational part of how we prevent gun violence. We can't pass the kinds of policies that we want to pass unless we know more about this epidemic in our country and more about what works to, to prevent it. Great, right. thank you so much. Um, this has been incredibly helpful and informative um, and persuasive. Uh, so I hope everybody is planning to take those actions in the future. This is incredibly important. Kelly, thank you for all of your work in putting together this report. Um, I'd like to remind everyone, we will be emailing out the link to this webinar. Um, so you will receive that within a few days. And again, we thank you all for your time and uh, interest in this really important issue um, and for your dedication and look forward to continuing to work with you all in the future. So thank you again, everyone.